Um, as we get this set up, I wanted to take a moment to, you're going to do a turn and talk with your partner on the, a quick question. We'll do about a minute. Um, but we've been talking about gaps all morning. We've been talking about achievement, attainment, uh, college going, what are charters doing. And in, in every session, I think we've heard questions from folks trying to peel back the onion. What, what, what works? Uh, what doesn't work? And so uh, as we go into this next section here, uh, I want you to take a minute with a partner on the question of, what do you think is the top cause of the achievement gaps that we're seeing, these persistent gaps by income, by race? Uh, what do you think of as a top cause for that? So take a minute with a partner. We'll hear from a few folks before we dive into the presentation. All right, we'll take about 10 seconds to wrap up. All right, let's hear from a few folks around the room. And uh, there, there is research coming. Uh, we do have a sense of the things that do drive. Um, uh, achievement at the levels needed to get college degrees and things like that. But what are some of the what are some of the things that come to your mind initially in thinking about this topic? Key causes or lead drivers for persistent gaps in achievement. Yeah. Okay. So power, vested interests, preserve the status quo. Great. Other thoughts. Opportunities, great. Take two or three other thoughts. Yeah. Segregated housing, housing segregation. Old style of schooling. Yeah. Public school funding being linked to property taxes. Great, so that's sort of an income piece there and how schools are funded. And last one over here, Anne Marie. Uh, views of students uh, that Ryan talked about a little bit earlier. Great. Um, so uh, you guys are, uh, are obviously really smart. A lot of, some of the audiences I talk to really go down the road of uh, you know, students' income or these, these things at early grades that you'll never recover from or preschool, you know, the sense of who belongs where. Uh, some, some students are, are so damaged that they couldn't possibly do amazing things. This sort of student-focused view of, of achievement gap uh, that uh, I want to talk about as really bringing together and would encourage us, uh, as many of you already do, but would encourage everyone to think about always using the term opportunity gap when you talk about an achievement gap. Uh, I think oftentimes the, the, the concept of achievement gap standing by itself uh, can be about thinking about a student as a low achiever versus thinking about the set of opportunities that you all talked about around the room that really are, are underpinning and, and creating and reproducing the achievement gap on a yearly basis. So this is my best friend, Jamie. Um, we grew up and did everything together. Um, in our childhoods uh, until this moment in high school when kids get assigned to classes on one side of the hallway that'll get them ready for college or they get something else on the other side. And my mom happened to have been a career school counselor and so she said, read right this way to get ready for, uh, for college and, and Stanford and all sorts of great things in my life. Uh, Jamie's mom had dropped out of uh, school after eighth grade, was a single mom raising five kids. And so not only uh, did she not have the chance to experience high school 
herself. Um, she didn't have the time to help Jamie figure out how to navigate it. So our opportunity set was fundamentally different um, in our lives. And in his words, he spent the past now almost two decades trying to make up for what was lost at that juncture in our lives. And it's been my passion and professional obsession to ensure that nobody goes missing from the set of opportunities that will enable the achievement uh, that, that can open doors for the future. So we will talk for a moment about some of the stakes here. Uh, folks have talked about these in different ways throughout, but I want to take it even one level deeper. There's the economic piece that we know, um, a permanent national recession deeper than the Great Recession, which we just went through, um, is seen by McKinsey and Company as, as the result uh, of the achievement gap. So this is you know, some of the American dream pursuit of happiness things, how are we doing on an economic basis. But it also talks about, uh, the achievement gap also affects other aspects of the American dream, life and liberty, um, as well as the pursuit of happiness. Um, when we think about where students belong, what sort of opportunities they deserve, uh, that connects intimately with things like the school to prison pipeline. Um, and when students aren't ready for the modern economy where we have a huge deficit uh, of workforce prepared for college level jobs, that's, that's actually the gap is not enough people prepared for college level jobs and all the labor market forecasts, uh, people have to go somewhere. And so uh, each year uh, we continue with a system of mass incarceration uh, that vastly disproportionately affects students in a way that mirrors strongly the achievement gap data that we see. And so the school to prison pipeline, I think, gets to the very heart of uh, liberty as well as the pursuit of happiness and even affects life and how we think of different lives, the emergence of the Black Lives Matter movement um, and, uh, and other factors. So uh, I think it is uh, on life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness Back to the economic piece of it at an individual level rather than an uh, 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 economy-wide level, you're looking at something like two times as much earnings in a lifetime uh, as a result of a college degree. Um, my uh, college advisor wrote this great book called Voice and Equality. He measured the sense uh, of the, the sort of volume of somebody's voice in democratic society. Um, the greater your voice, the greater your influence over systems, policies, government, um, and, and things that affect your life on a daily basis, um, and looked at how unequal voice was by race and income groups. Um, in my thesis, I really trace that back to the core underlying principle that's actually determining political voice in society is education. Um, and so I think that you just wanted to broaden out sort of how we're thinking about the stakes of, uh, of educational achievement and opportunity gaps. And then it was talked to about in terms of the California context, zooming out to the national context. Uh, it is true that students of color are, in fact, the majority of the US uh, K-12 school population uh, and will continue to be an ever larger majority by all forecasts in the years ahead. So a persistent and continued failure to provide equitable opportunities to learn and achieve college degrees is going to have increasing consequences with every passing year. Um, and, and so this, back to this idea of really going beneath the achievement gap to the opportunity gap. Uh, there is no achievement gap without discussing opportunity. Opportunity uh, precedes uh, and, and makes achievement possible. So another student example, uh, this was a student of mine in uh, Beaufort, South Carolina where I taught and was an administrator. Um, and uh, you could look at Carl's achievement. He had a 1.7 GPA. Um, he was in the lowest level courses in uh, the high school where I taught. Um, I happened to be his, uh, his coach and, uh, for uh, cross country running and soccer and other things and found him just fascinated with all sorts of interesting topics, wanting to debate and discuss how would we think about this, how would we prove that, how would we do this, how would we do that. If you think in terms of the achievement gap, you say, well, Carl's a low achiever. If you think in terms of the opportunity gap, um, as, as we did at that school, uh, ended up moving Carl from the lowest level courses to the highest level courses in the school. This was a school with a quarter mile long hallway that divided two systems, um, even though the Beaufort County schools had been desegregated at the, at the school level, uh, it was segregated and divided by this long hallway, where on one side of the hallway you could see a 12th grade English class playing an all class game of hangman, and the teacher saying, who wants to guess the next letter? 
and on the other side, uh, kids reading books and debating and discussing really interesting and fascinating issues. You think in terms of achievement gap, uh, you think, well, what's wrong with Carl? You think in terms of opportunity gap, you have to, you have to move Carl up and give him great opportunity. So we uh, upgraded him to all the toughest courses in the school and he graduated ready for college um, instead of on the educational off-ramps um, and saw it as uh, the chance of a lifetime and one that uh, not many people get when we talk about persistent uh, opportunity gaps uh, throughout our country. Uh, the school I was at uh, also sort of, you know, again, for sort of achievement versus opportunity, you walked into this, this building and actually on the right, the first thing you saw was this big glass enclosure um, and it was elevated and there was about 10 different sort of seats uh, up in there elevated and they were all security officers, including armed police officers with this notion of uh, this, is, this is the type of students we have here, this is the type of environment and, and places that they belong and the opportunities we have will be the opportunities to interact with law enforcement, uh, opportunities to try to be, uh, be uh, engaged with staying out of trouble and these sorts of things. I lobbied unsuccessfully to get that uh, enclosure changed to really be all about the advanced coursework opportunities we had college and things like that. Um, and then, oh, it's, I should introduce it. It's gonna play, it's a video here. Uh, to give you an example of a student um, where the focus is really on the opportunity because this student comes up in a system like the one I taught in and then happened to transfer into a different system uh, that changed the set of opportunities. So this is Joe Dizzy. There are people out there who have a lot to offer the world but they're never given that fair chance to challenge themselves academically to do what they're capable of. In middle school, I was very shy. I didn't want to interact with other students. I wore a hoodie in 96 degree weather just because I wanted to create a barrier between myself and the rest of the world. When I transferred here, I sat down with my counselor. He noticed that I'd always had good grades. He recommended taking harder classes. Some of these students, they're excelling in these easier classes. Our staff takes the initiative to challenge these children to take harder classes that could benefit them. My junior year, I took AP Chemistry, which is a class that seniors take. I was the youngest student in the district to take the class and I passed it. Senior year I took AP Comparative Politics. It wasn't so easy as it was before, but when I got into AP classes, I found I have the potential to do a lot more than what I've been doing in the past. My plans for the future, I'm gonna be attending college at Pacific Lutheran University. I plan to major in chemical engineering. These advanced placement courses has allowed me to come out of my shell. I'd still be that shy guy if it weren't for Federal Way and faculty to support me and push me and let me know that I'm, I'm capable of doing so much more. So it really gives you a sense of the opportunity gap in thinking uh, about a student in one context who puts up a hood uh, because the school doesn't see him, doesn't respect him, doesn't recognize him for who he is, changes into a system that fundamentally sees opportunity differently and immediately reaches out to him and says, what, what areas are you passionate about? We're gonna get you in the most challenging classes. Jodice, he takes off his hood, uh, becomes class president, is now uh, finishing up his college degree. And in the video, you saw his brother who was uh, sitting there uh, looking up to him and, and following in his footsteps. Um, so just to put it a little bit in context, you know, just mentioned some of the, the significant implications. It's health, wealth, it's political voice. Um, it, it's all these really significant things, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness at the top here, the American dream. Uh, and achievement, and, and we can talk a lot about achievement gaps, and what I'm encouraging us to continue to do here is to always talk about the opportunity gaps that, uh, that create the achievement gaps that we see. So um, one framework for thinking about this is what types of opportunity gaps are there. Uh, there's a few major types that are really well documented, um, including by uh, the Education Trust uh, that, um, that Ryan uh, represented here earlier. Um, the spending gap, uh, is uh, roughly nationally, depending on whether you're looking at race or income, $1.2 to $2,000 difference in spending per student based on race and based on income. Um, so looking at school, looking at the per pupil spending um, for particularly black and Latino students and seeing a persistent uh, underinvestment in the education of those students. Um, and this is true, by the way, even when you look within a district. So you can say, well, you know, we have the, the, the propositions and the, the property taxes and the state things that, you know, you can't, can't fix all of that. 
Um, but this is true even within districts. Within districts, um, school, uh, school district officials consistently and reliably spend less money on their students that have uh, on their schools that have more students of color and low-income students. So that's within their budget and their discretion. They're not hampered by state policy, but they continually uh, underinvest um, in certain communities. Um, and uh, teachers, uh, depending again on what you're looking at, there's variation in the number. Um, but low-income students and students of color across the nation about twice as likely uh, to receive novice teachers. Uh, substantially more likely to receive teachers who are out of their field area of study, who don't have majors in the subject, et cetera. Um, so these are decisions made every day uh, at the policy level and at the local level to deploy resources differently uh, to students uh, by race and income. And then the curriculum gap piece here, um, when I asked the question earlier about uh, what drives the achievement and attainment gap, this is research out of the US Department of Education, uh, suggests that academic intensity in high school, the opportunity to experience rigorous learning opportunities, which is supposed to be what school is all about, drives college completion more than any other factor. More than a student's uh, income level, more even than their eighth grade test scores. You might think, well, everything's baked and done by the time a student hits eighth grade. It's not the case. Uh, if you provide an academically intense set of high school learning opportunities, uh, you'll see uh, college completion go up substantially. So that's where Equal Opportunity Schools, the organization I found and run, focuses. This is a national gaps chart. Uh, we published some of uh, the earlier data from years prior to this. Uh, it's my one squint chart um, for you guys to sort of see the, see the detailed data in a complex way. So uh, what this shows here is it's double disaggregation by race and income. I think it's important to look at those things. Sometimes people will say it's one or the other, but, but disaggregating by both, you can see patterns um, across the data. And what you see here, uh, as one example, uh, African-American students uh, consistently less than half as likely to participate in AP and IB courses, um, college-level learning experiences in high school, getting that academic intensity. Uh, we found uh, that this is not a result of uh, predominantly uh, schools with predominantly students of color not having these programs. Uh, the programs exist in the schools where 90% of our students uh, go to school, and uh, this is about decisions within the, uh, the building on a daily basis about who gets access to those opportunities and why. And uh, San Jose Unified School District. I worked with this district uh, when I was uh, here at Stanford. I would ride the Caltrain down every day. I was still learning how to use Excel and figure out how data works, uh, manipulating data and putting together PowerPoints, uh, and ultimately helping them on those dashed lines of what we call missing students say, who are those students in that gap? Uh, what do we know about them? Who could talk to them? Uh, what, could, what, could we, uh, what could we do? Um, and what we saw here is a year, and by the way, this pattern was representative of 99% of diverse uh, high schools in the US. So that means almost any school around here that you want to walk into, uh, you will walk down a diverse hallway and you'll take a right-hand turn into the AP or IB classroom and you'll see a lot of that diversity fall away. 99% uh, of diverse uh, schools face these types of gaps in the US, opportunity gaps in access to rigor. And what we saw a year later was that they were able to join that 1% of schools. Uh, this is a district-wide data chart, actually, one of the largest systems to have ever closed these gaps. Um, fully reflect the diversity and talent of their uh, students at the highest levels. Some may say, well, putting kids in a class in high school, uh, that, does that make any sense? What about these earlier achievement gaps? Can kids do it? Um, what we found is, is that the pass rate on the AP and IB tests went up uh, when we did this. This was the same thing that happened in South Carolina. The pass rates went up sub substantially when we closed the access gaps. Um, and even more exciting, I think, is that educators love doing this work. So uh, the principal uh, of one of the schools that got all this data and, and coaching work for me uh, said it was the highlight of her career to stop talking about discipline and dropout and failure and these sorts of things and start talking about great opportunities for students. Um, do folks know the, the aspiration rate um, in terms of the percent of schools uh, of students who want to go to college? Very hesitant 
murmurings out there. Um, so it's not, a, it's again, to this achievement versus opportunity gap, it's not on the student. 90% of students want to go to college. 90% of parents expect their students to go to college. This doesn't vary significantly by race or income. Uh, the aspirations are there. Um, we saw some things earlier about the degree attainment rate that folks may remember. Closer to around 30% of students actually uh, persevering to obtain a, a degree within six years of graduating high school. Uh, so this huge gulf um, that, that I'm making the case really comes back to the opportunity gap. And so knowing that academic intensity in high school is such a significant factor, we ask uh, in surveys of, of uh, more, well over a million students now across the country, are you challenged by your classes? Um, and we see the, the answer to that question is very close to the college completion rate. So, uh, and it, it beca so you, you're seeing 70% or so nationally of students not being challenged by their classes, and especially uh, severe for students of color, not in advanced high school classes. 86% um, uh, not being challenged by their classes. And to think of, of, uh, of that in the context of some of the conversations that we have about what students might or might not be able to do, uh, why are they not achieving, what's going on here, what can we do differently. There are a lot of complexities in charter school management and all of these other issues, but if this proportion of uh, students are showing up every day in order to get ready for college, and are not being challenged by their classes, they're not receiving the basic opportunities needed to do that, that's something that we can really um, sink our teeth into and begin to change. So uh, peel back a little bit further here in terms of how those opportunity gaps play out in a school. Um, we're seeing that students by race and income have different levels of information about programs like AP and IB. So this would be low-income students, uh, Latino students, African-American students, uh, have hugely uh, different uh, sense of the information needed to participate in these programs, uh, encouragement to participate in advanced programs, similar gulfs um, in, uh, in encouragement. You may find at a given school white and Asian middle and upper income students uh, being four times as likely to be encouraged by an adult in their school to participate in advanced courses, um, and very different sense of belonging and who belongs there. Uh, over across our whole portfolio of, of work, we see in 75% of cases that when you close these access gaps, when you close those opportunity gaps, the success rates uh, are stable or increased. So in other words, the quality doesn't decline. It's not that students can't handle it. It's not that they're going to water it down. Um, students, uh, as Jaime Escalante said, uh, will rise to the level of expectations. Uh, this is our team. It's, uh, it's a, a tremendous group of people. Just was going to show you a few things about this, the sense of, of movement that's developed around this particular opportunity gap, an incredible set of folks uh, that we work with, a lot of, of whom are from Stanford, an incredible set of donor partners uh, that work with us, and an incredible set of information. So this is from the data standpoint uh, to some of the questions people were asking about that earlier. Typically, you may look at this amount of data to, to see a student and see their achievement. And instead of opportunity preceding achievement, using achievement data to determine opportunity. So we know this student has such and such a GPA, such and such a writing score, uh, math score, critical reading score. Maybe they're not really ready for advanced courses. What we do at Equal Opportunity Schools is we fill in the broader set of data uh, that really relates to the student. So you find out uh, that she wants to be the first in her family to complete college um, and that uh, she was bullied early in high school and had low grades as a result of that. Um, she has four adults who think she's ready for advanced courses um, and all sorts of other factors that really put her in a good position to that, but no one's ever talked to her about it. So we can go and use that data to, to close an opportunity gap. Um, we've been working with um, uh, the ideas here at Stanford uh, on sense of belonging. Claude Steele, who's a pioneer in that field. Um, we've been working with the Pertz Center on activating growth mindset uh, and uh, student belonging. Uh, I have to give thanks to the Rakes Foundation for their generous support of our work in this area. Um, they're here with us today. Um, 
and then uh, been featured in, uh, recently in a, a book and a Stanford Social Innovation Review article uh, as having a really strong strategy as an organization to get this type of work done. We made a commitment to find 100,000 missing students over a three-year period with the College Board and IB, uh, recognized by the former U.S. Secretary of Education and the White House for this work. So all that's by, we have state commitments to be, become the first states in the U.S. to ever close these access gaps. Um, and fully reflect student diversity at the highest levels of K-12. Um, but all of that is to, is to say, uh, as I wrap up here, um, opportunity gaps are a great place to focus because they're concrete. I would encourage folks as you think about research, as you think about practice, to make things concrete. A gap in a percent and this and that uh, is actually a set of students. And so that's why we talk about 750,000 missing students each year. An achievement gap is this, is this abstract thing. An opportunity gap is a set of changes for a set of individuals that can be made um, on the ground. Um, and so I think that's powerful, but it's also a, a tangled uh, web that, that any practitioners in the room will, will certainly well appreciate. Um, so uh, I've been frustrated, I think, also by the, the lack of progress. Even though we've moved quickly, um, we still have uh, well over half a million students each year who are stuck in that position of being literally across the hall from the opportunity they need and deserve. The data seems really clear. Uh, the, the support we've gained is significant. Um, but this is a, a, this is a, there's, a, there's a school not too far from here um, that uh, I wanted to work with for many years. And uh, they have one of the most segregated advanced programs in the entire uh, US. Um, and uh, worked over many years, got together a group of funders, got together the district people, people from the board, people from the university, and we said, can we tackle this opportunity gap within your system? And they said, well, we need to work on people getting into ninth grade first, because there's a lot of work to do there. Okay, I'll come back in two years when the kids are in 11th grade. Okay, well, I'm not sure we're ready. Okay, we got the resources. Okay, we'll try it. Um, and worked with this, uh, this system for, for years, and ultimately came down to a meeting with myself and the superintendent and a member of the board of directors, a stack of those student insight cards that I showed you. Um, we said at this particular high school, there are 300 missing students um, who deserve this opportunity. We have 80% of the staff at that school that thinks it's important to close this gap. All of the students in this list are being recommended by teachers to do this work. Um, I, I, it was a two-hour meeting, the superintendent, all sorts of these reasons here and there, and I said, I don't understand. We have the will of the staff, we have the data on the students, we have funders ready to support this, I got your board member here. What else do you need uh, in order to, to, to create this set of opportunities? And his answer was uh, time. And it's the same answer that, that uh, confronted uh, desegregationists in the South, and otherwise this notion of, oh, you know, Actually changing how we allocate opportunities, uh, it, it's, just gonna, it's just gonna take uh, longer. And so uh, that school, uh, very close by, uh, remains uh, pretty fully uh, segregated internally to this day, despite all the evidence and momentum to the contrary. So um, just uh, as I mentioned before, thanks for uh, uh, having me. Thank you very much for listening to the talk, but encourage people to think about achievement gap in, in policy and economics. Uh, but also in the context of what's specific, what's concrete, what's local. These gaps in opportunities that create those are as close to you as the nearest high school uh, and only as wide as that hallway. And the more that in our research and in our practice, we can take it out of the, the, uh, the sort of nebulous sense of this, this huge set of things that we couldn't possibly and, and call it what it is in terms of a number of students, a set of opportunities um, because the future is really going to be determined in those, those classrooms for us. So thank you very much.